All right, that's the end of that. Let's start chapter two, the atom. All right, the history of the atom. You do not need to memorize everything here. You should be familiar with it. So let the students read through it quickly. We're gonna go more into detail into the ones that are more important for the region. So that would be Rutherford. Um, they probably heard Rutherford conducted a gold foil experiment. So what he did was he took a piece of gold foil and he shot alpha particles, which you need, you'll know, you probably know from nuclear chem are positively charged. He shot them at a piece of gold foil. And what he saw is that most of them passed through the foil. So what he determined from that is that the atom is mostly made up of empty space because the particles were able to go through. The second observation is that he made is that some of the particles were deflected, meaning they bounced back to him. So from that, he determined that the atom has a dense core of positive charge, which he called the nucleus because positive and positive repel. So the alpha particle repelled the nucleus and came back to him. Um, one more thing I want to mention back to here is the wave mechanical model is the one that we have today. It tells us that electrons are in something called an orbital. Um, the orbital is the most probable location of an electron, meaning we don't know the exact location, but it's most probably in the orbital. All right, let's go to the questions. In a wave mechanical model of the atom, an orbital is defined as, like we said, one, a region of the most probable, oh no, not one, not proton location, uh, a region of the most probable electron location, choice two. Which term identifies the most probable location? Same model, it's going to be the orbital. Two. Uh, next, which conclusion was drawn from the result of the gold foil experiment? So remember, he concluded two things. Atom is mostly empty space and it has a positively charged nucleus. So the one here is two and atom is mostly empty space. And the last question, which statement describes a concept included in a wave mechanical model of this atom? Uh, describes a concept included in a wave mechanical model. It's talking about electrons, that one. So one, two, and three are out just because they're not even talking about electrons. Electrons are located in orbitals outside the nucleus. Not more. All right, here they give you a list of the history of the atom. See why you don't have to memorize it. If they expect you to know more in detail, they give it to you. So state the model that first included electrons as subatomic particles. Let's go to the picture. Uh, and it says uh, in the Bohr model, we have... Uh, sorry. Yeah. The Bohr model is the first one that mentions an electron. If you look, the word electron doesn't show up in any of the other Dalton, Thompson, or Rutherford. Um, state one conclusion about the internal structure of the atom that resulted from the gold foil. So you can say either of the two things that we said. It's mostly empty space or it has a dense nucleus, positively charged. All right, 68, using the conclusion from the Rutherford model, identify the charged subatomic particle that's located in the nucleus. You know the charged particle in the nucleus is a proton. You don't even have to check this chart. And state one way in which the Bohr model agrees with the Thomson model. So let's go here and see what do they agree on. So they say atoms have small negatively charged particles as part of their internal structures. And uh, neg they negatively charged particles and packets of energy are absorbed or emitted by atoms when an electron uh, changes cell shell. So they both agree on the electrons, which actually makes me think that 66, state the model that first included electrons as subatomic particles is gonna be Thomson, right? Yeah, atoms have small negatively charged particles as part of their internal structure. They expect you to know negatively charged particles are electrons. Sorry. All right, here are the subatomic particles. You probably knew them already. Proton has a charge of plus one and a mass of one AMU. It's in the nucleus. Neutron, no charge, mass, one AMU. It's in the nucleus. Electron has a charge of minus one, um, basically a mass of zero, and it's, it's in orbitals around the nucleus. Uh, you need to know this notation that represents an element with its number of protons down here, and A represents the mass number, which is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if they give you mass number and protons, you just subtract protons from mass number to get neutrons. So here's an example. The mass number is 14, number of protons six, number of neutrons we need to subtract. 14 minus six is eight. All right, it's always gonna be, this is always the first question on your region. So no reason to get it wrong. Which particle has a mass that is approximately equal to the mass of a proton? Neutron, one AMU, one AMU. Which particle has two neutrons, which means you have to subtract. It's gonna be the helium because 
four is the mass number, minus two protons gives you two neutrons. Compared to the charge of a proton, the charge of an electron has the same magnitude because it's both one, but the opposite sign because it's plus one and minus one. So the answer is going to be four. Which subatomic particles are found in the nucleus? Who cares of what atom? Protons and neutrons always in the nucleus. Which statement describes the charge of an electron and the charge of a proton? Okay, plus one and minus one, or minus one and plus one. Which statement describes the location of two types of subatomic particles? Protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. Choice one. No, more. Uh, an atom that contains six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons has a mass of, remember, it's only the protons and the neutrons, so six plus six, 12 U, not grams. Uh, what is the charge of the nucleus of a copper atom? So for that, you would need to go to your periodic table, see how many protons it is, and that's the charge, plus whatever that is. Which subatomic particles are paired with their charge? All right, this we know. Compare the mass of a proton to the mass of an electron. All you need to write, it's more, the mass of a proton is higher than the mass of an electron. All right, now isotopes. Isotopes are different forms of the same element, which means there are different forms of carbon. Um, the atomic number or the number of protons must stay the same because if we change the number of protons, we're changing the element that we have, right? If we went to seven, we would be talking about nitrogen now. But what does change is the number of neutrons and therefore the mass number because mass is proton plus neutrons. Um, different isotopes uh, exist in nature at varying amounts, meaning in the world right now, there's a lot more carbon-12 than there is of carbon-14, and there's also very little carbon-13. So that's called the relative abundance, how much of it there is in the world. And the way to um, calculate its atomic mass, we want to take a weighted average. We don't want to take a regular average 12 plus 13 plus 14 because they exist in different amounts. We want to take those amounts into consideration. So what you do is you convert the percentage into a decimal, which just means you move the decimal over twice. You multiply it by the atomic mass. You do that for each of them. They could list two, they could list three, four, whatever they want, and add them all up. So we have 0.57 times 120 plus 0.43 times 122. And then when you type it in, you get the weighted atomic mass. All right, so many questions. Which notations represent hydrogen isotopes? The, always in isotopes, the bottom number needs to be the same. There's only one choice here, choice one, where the bottom number is the same and top number is allowed to change. So choice one. Which notations represent different isotopes of the element sodium? Sodium is not S. Good, nice try. It's Na, we know. And it has nothing to do with charge. It's the top number is allowed to change. Okay, if they wrote the bottom number, it would be the same. The atomic mass of magnesium is the weighted average of the atomic masses of all of the naturally occurring isotopes. So that means like for carbon, there were three of them. There's carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14. Don't let them think the two most abundant. No, we're always gonna include all of them even if they're 0 0.00001%. All right, here they ask you which numerical setup can be used to determine the atomic mass. Remember, you're gonna turn decimal into percent and multiply by the atomic mass. So the answer would be choice two. Okay, don't divide by two, it's not a regular average. Um, same thing here, you're going to set it up the same way. And this time they ask you again to set it up, but they don't give you multiple choice. So this is the one that we had before, 0.57 times this number plus 0.43 times that number. You don't even have to solve it, they just ask for a numerical setup. All right, next on the periodic table, you're also going to see a little corner in the bottom left corner, the electron configuration. What that means is the electrons we know are located in different shells. The first shell can only hold two electrons, so the rest of them need to go to the next shell. The next shell can only hold eight, so if there's more than ten, they're going to need to go to the, the next shell. Okay, so this represents two in the first, four in the second. Um, valence electrons, you need to know their definition. They're the electrons that are located in the outermost uh, shell. So just look at the last number listed for the electron configuration. Based on the number of valence electrons, we can now draw a Lewis diagram, which just means you draw, you write the element and one dot to represent each valence electron. So P phosphorus has five valence electrons, draw P with five dots around it. All right, which element has six valence electrons um, in each of its atoms? Uh, really, you have to go to the periodic table, look at one of these, it should have a six listed as the last number in the electron configuration. Which element has atoms in the ground state with the greatest number of valence electrons? Again, you're gonna have to look it up, see what the last number listed is and choose that. In the ground state, an atom of which element has two valence electrons? Same idea, and let's 
chapter. Uh, compare the energy of an electron in the first shell uh, to the energy of an electron in the third shell. So as you go out to further shells, you're gaining energy. So the electrons in the third shell would have more energy than the electrons in the first shell. All right, now atomic spectra. Um, we know that the ground state is just the electron configuration as it's written in your periodic table, lowest energy. So magnesium, two in the first, eight in the second, two in the third. An excited state is when one electron jumps from a lower energy level to a higher one. So one from here, jump to the next one. So it's instead of 282, 2811. Um, it needs to, in order to do that, it needs to absorb energy. But once it does that and it's in an excited state, it's very temporary, right? Think about you jumping up. You don't, can't just stay up. You need to fall back down. As you fall back down, uh, as the electrons fall back down, they release energy. But this energy that they release is released as an emission spectrum. They release light when they do it. Okay, so if you had a, a spectrometer, you could put your, your um, element in and it would give you a spectra. Each element has a different spectra. So you can use this to identify what element you have. If you don't know what you have, you put it in the machine, it gives you a spectra. Come back to the, the known spectra. If you look it up for any element, it's online and compare it. Okay, it's like the fingerprint because each element has a different spectrum and it works the same way like gel electrophoresis, which means, remember from the bioregion, if they give you a mixture to determine what's in it, you just look at what matches. So this mixture would have strontium in it and lithium because these lines match. All right, which electron configuration represents electrons in an atom of Ga in an excited state? It's probably two, but you have to look it up. Yeah, it looks like it would be two. Uh, when an excited electron and an atom moves to the ground state, the electron, so now it's an excited, it's going back down, it needs to emit energy as it moves to a lower energy state. So the answer is four here. Uh, which electron configuration represents an atom of magnesium in an excited state? So normal magnesium is 282, so it would be 273. One from the second shell jump to the third. The atoms in a sample of an element are in an excited state. A bright line spectrum is produced when these atoms go back down, so emit energy. All right, fireworks that contain metallic salts, all right, yeah, whatever. Explain why the electron configuration 2711 represents a sodium atom in the, in the excited state. You can just say the one from the third shell jumped to the fourth shell. Explain in terms of electron how a strontium salt emits colored light when this electron falls back down. Okay, so it's just one goes up and then back down, emits light. State how the bright line spectra viewed through a spectroscope can be used to identify the metal ions in the salts. You just uh, compare it to known spectra, right? You type it in, I'm not sure what I have. Type in lithium, oh, it matches, I have lithium. Okay. Atoms versus ions. Atoms are neutral, meaning they don't have a charge. They have the same number of protons as electrons. So if you have plus six, you need to have minus six. Ions are electrically charged, meaning they could be positively charged or negatively charged. If you take electrons away, you're taking away a negative, you'll be left with a positive charge. Or if you add electrons, you're adding a negative, so you now have a negative ion. These have different names. Negative ions are anions. I don't know why this arrow is here, but they gained electrons. When you gain something, you get bigger. You eat more, you get bigger. So if you gain electrons, your radius of the ion is going to be bigger. For cations positive, they lost electrons. So the radius of the ion is now going to be smaller, right? You lost weight, you got smaller. Great. Um, electrons you need to know are always lost from the farthest or orbital. So if you have uh, 281 and you lose one electron, you're becoming 28, which will, you'll see, they'll ask questions about which noble gas does it match? Okay, so let's see those questions. All right, which ion in the ground state has the same electron configuration as an atom of argon? So argon has an electron configuration of, let's see, two, Argon has 288. So we're looking for something that after it gained or lost electrons is going to have uh, an electron configuration of 288. So that would be K plus. K regular is 2881. Once it loses one, it's becoming 288. So what you want to look at is the ones, the metals in groups one and two are always going to go backwards a row. And the ones um, that are non-metals are going to go forwards to become uh, the electron configuration of the noble gas at the end of that row. Compare the radius of a potassium ion to a potassium atom. Potassium, if you look it up, its ion is K+, plus, so it's losing an electron, it's getting smaller. Explain in terms of electrons why the radius of a potassium atom 
is larger than the radius of a potassium ion. Same question as above because it, it lost an electron. All right, let's, let's 